The presentation today is divided into three areas. Firstly, I'll give a brief history of the digital innovation projects I've worked with, focusing on youth engagement through the digitization of intergenerational sharing of knowledge, community led digitization of cultural heritage, and an example of purposeful digitization. Then we will take a brief look at some of the equipment and software we use and the results achieved, how much it costs, and how we put the media to use. Finally, We'll look at the methods of using the data segregation of public heritage as an archival, preservation, promotional, funding, and educational tool. As I mentioned in my introduction, networking at conferences like this one is very important, especially for cultural heritage digitization, be it just from sharing each other's social media posts about cultural heritage, to collaboration on multi institutional projects with a large media and digital archive alike. Networking, even on an informal between institutions and more importantly, people can help create some of the digital preservation of tangible and intangible cultural heritage, the sharing of discovered best practices for digitizing, funding applications for retail, sharing of digitized equipment, etc. So, again, I'll ensure my presentation doesn't run too long and I won't keep it from. The digitization of cultural heritage has been a very large part of my work over the last five years. From producing short promotional videos to keep funders happy and off the principal investigative backs, to collaborating with small national and community museums, to provide them with tailored educational media as well as promotional media for their institutions. Working with the Community Crafts and Culture Project and the European Award winning EU LAC Museums Project, part of my research was centered around three communities in Costa Rica the Brunken Indigenous Communities of Reykjavik and Brunke in the south and the town of San Vicente's indigenous peoples on museum in the north. Through these projects, we soon discovered that our ideas of digitization varied greatly to theirs. The project's Costa Rican principal investigator, Ronald Martinez Villarreal of the National Museum of Costa Rica, soon pointed out that the best approach was to just ask the communities what they actually needed. To which the reply was akin to, no, we don't need funding for a shiny new website or an online shop for our crafts. What we really need is a means of engaging the young people of the community in their cultural heritage to show they have a place in this community whilst they're living in a growing homogenous global digital world. The two Brunken communities decided then that the young people should be tasked through their school to collect their genealogy by questioning their parents and grandparents, along with other family members. This information was to be recorded on their own devices and then collated and stored on project donated laptops, thus enabling the young people to trace back through the records their own genealogy, giving them a sense of place and also a further understanding of their identity as an Indigenous group, whilst also preserving for the community as a whole a genealogical record for their own use. Moving forward, all the projects I've been involved with have used this grounds up approach means of digitisation to cement their vision for purposeful digitisation. This is reflected in the EU LAC Museums Project's Youth Exchange Programme between Costa Rica and the Isle of Skye, led by Jamie Allen Brown of the University of St. Andrews. Here, the project tasked the young people taking part to digitally collect intangible cultural heritage stories from their elders on their own devices, digitise cultural heritage workshops, project needed equipment, engage in social media output, as well as encouraging them to express their opinions about the important matters affecting their cultural heritage, locally and internationally. These various methods of cultural heritage digitization are key in engaging the community's young people to probably hence unknown or unrealized aspects of their heritage and community itself, whilst also providing the means of archiving said cultural heritage. The success of this engagement is quantifiable in an example of a typical shy and retiring young person who is involved in the program. They went on to represent their community's use on the board of the island's community trust, citing the project as the main driving force behind their decision. Now, an example of purposeful digitization, and by purposeful digitization, I mean asking yourself, what else can I use this digitization for? And will that change the how, why, what, or where I go about it? This example can be shown with the Royal Society of Edinburgh and Share Down Stories projects work with the Shetland Museum and Archive situated on one of the islands of Shetland in Scotland. For their Croft Museum, 
Now, a croft being a traditional Scottish island of land and homestead, which contained the everyday items they needed to live off the sea and land in a long and sustainable manner. What they required for the Croft Museum was a virtual tour for promotional purposes that they could also embed on their website as an educational aid for schools on other remote islands who struggled to have in-person visits. However, after a brief discourse, we also ended up making various short films of the museum curator, Dr Ian Tate, giving a demonstration and history of the Croft and the objects therein. Here's one example of a short video for the Croft Museum. Now, this item here, maybe not seen one before, but I'll show you what it does. Maybe me figure out the purpose. You can see this a thing like a goalpost here. And there's a wooden base and a lid on it. Now, if you open up the lid, it's hinged at one end. It only go that high. It doesn't go very far open. And there's this peg here at the front, which engages with a bar inside the box. Now, I need to keep it under tension there, and in order to keep it under tension, put a rock on top. What you're left with there is not just a piece of still life, but it does something. And for this, we need one rodent. Here's a mouse I've prepared earlier. And uh, what they did was they put something in there to attract the mouse, maybe some oatmeal, something like that, maybe a nice piece of oily fish, like a bit of mackerel, perhaps. And along comes the mouse, like so, makes his way inside until he gets to the wooden bar. And you can see from his tail sticking out there, we've got a mouse. And sure enough, it's pretty flat. The Shetland Museum were then able to self-generate QR codes which link to these videos uploaded to YouTube. These QR codes were then placed on information panels at the Croft Museum, allowing visitors to be able to scan the QR code in situ and watch the demonstration of the items on display. These short videos were also able to be embedded in the virtual tour, lending a further dynamic to the educational aspect as well as the promotional. The Shared Island Stories project was also able to use these two simple means of digitization to create an open source archival video, highlighting the history and contents of an important piece of Scottish cultural heritage. And to achieve all of the above, it simply involved a strategic method of digitization. I'm now going to look at some of the equipment we used in the projects. Firstly, I have to point out how extremely important it is to any media containing audio that the quality of the assignment is as high as possible. If you have good quality sound, then the quality of images or video doesn't have to be so high. But it's obvious that if you have high quality sound and images, then that's true. We use two different types of small microphones. This small cabled microphone is available from various online stores. Ours was bought from Alibaba.com, just a few pounds or 700 pump wires from a spider CD. This microphone is then plugged into the audio software of my iPhone Success, which is a fairly old phone you need. The audio is then recorded on the Voice Memos app. This app should be on all iPhones. Alternatively, a well-positioned phone without a connected microphone can also produce fairly good quality audio. The other microphone we use is a wireless one with a receiver plugging directly into the lighting port of the iPhone. This microphone is slightly more expensive, around 1,400 CFP. It does need to be charged and may be influenced by outside signals. However, I've never had that issue with myself. As for images and video, we've recently started moving away from a fairly expensive digital camera and started using a DJI Osmo Pocket 2, which you can see here. I've been using this camera for the projects to record various videos. As you can see yourself, the quality is extremely good for such a small device. These cameras were the ones we provided to communities in Costa Rica for the young people to digitize their cultural heritage workshops. Simple to use, excellent features, and comparatively inexpensive to the basic package, around 47,000 CFP. Or you can purchase the Creator Combo package at 62,000 CFP. This package also includes a wireless microphone amongst other equipment. If this type of camera is beyond your budget, however, 
you can still produce good to high quality images and video from a phone or tablet. The final piece of equipment I want to show you is the Ricoh Theta 360 degree camera. This camera is operated via a mobile phone and tablet, and in conjunction with online hosting sites, the images are uploaded and used to produce the virtual tours. A word of caution, however, up until recently, we had been using roundme.com. This site is no longer operating, so all the work we've done up to now has to be re-uploaded and re-edited all over again to a different site before it can be utilised by the institutions it's made for. So it's vitally important for reasons like this that you ensure all your raw data is stored on your own hard drive, as well as perhaps a separate one, so you don't lose anything. These three things, a microphone, a digital camera of some type, and a 360 degree camera should be all you need to produce great quality out with a large variety of uses. If, for example, you want to produce some media to highlight a change or a new exhibit in your museum, record a school, a school group learning how to make a traditional meal that we use to show funders the need for cultural preservation, or making an archive or digital record of intangible cultural heritage, you should always be asking us, what else can this be used for? Now a quick word on software. There are a few options here. You may choose to use the basic free editing suite, for example. YouTube Studio can be used fairly easily for doing video. Adobe's Premiere Pro or Apple's Final Cut Pro X are two more complex paid-for programs. But I believe both do offer short-term licensing options, which may suit budgets better. I personally use Final Cut Pro X, which I find very easy and straightforward to use. The idea of networking may be able to come into play here, not only for perhaps gathering together to purchase a multi-user license for software, but also sharing the cost of equipment with the institutions that will be using it. There's no point in three different institutions that are attending this conference, each purchasing an Osmo pocket camera, using it for what they need and then it's sitting in the door for six months until it's needed again. Sharing the cost is a way to allow you to buy more equipment that can be used by the communities or researchers to gather even more information. And from an editor's point of view, having more variety of footage and audio makes for a far better output than having limited it. It also allows for the best possible representation of the aspects of cultural heritage you're preserving and sharing with communities. Now, how do we best put these digitised cultural heritage assets that we have to use? We found in our projects, you firstly need a basic plan of what you and the communities both need to achieve with it. Is it actually shiny new website and content? Shared, used and controlled by the community to directly promote Indigenous people's heritage? So as to entice a completely different, more sustainable type of cultural tourist? separate from the daily coach rules that arrive from the nearest hotel that perhaps only spend 60 minutes learning basket reading before leaving again. Is it for educational purposes in the communities? Engaging schools and community centres to help introduce hitherto unknown or unrealised aspects of their cultural heritage? Or is it a plea to funders that a community needs help in preserving its heritage through engaging its young people? Or so its heritage is not lost through disinterest, through erosion, lost land issues, tourism overdevelopment, or depopulation? Is it for all of the above and more? This plan should help guide you in the process of the what, where, and the how of digitizing, so you don't end up with the institutional equivalent of a person's hard drive full of unusual pictures on sunsets and places of history. Then you ask, what platform is it for? Will it be used on social media? Available on YouTube? Making sure you take care of intellectual property rights, copyright issues, and sharing licenses. Embedded in websites is publicly available archives or videos, research outputs, or is it for virtual tours, or again, all of the above and more. These two thought processes will help ensure you put limited resources to the best possible use as research material, funding proposal material, archival records, promotional and educational aids. The more we digitise purposely, the more we can garner from, not just from a researcher or professional point of view, but also from the point of view of the communities and the culture that we're digitizing. The key is to always remember that any digitizing we conduct of cultural heritage must always be beneficial to the community we're serving. I'm not sure if there's to be time for questions or if you're straight off the court and the all-important networking, but thank you very much for listening, and I'll now hand back to the live feed.
Thank you very much, John, for this presentation. Uh, pour les francophones, uh, nous n'avions pas reçu le texte de la vidéo, donc uh, c'était compliqué pour. Et pardon aux traducteurs pour la traduction, du coup. Uh, voilà. Uh, Est-ce que quelqu'un a des questions? Uh, John, did you select the interpretation button on your Zoom application? Yes, I have the English interpretation switched on. Okay, great. Donc vous pouvez parler en français pour les questions. Can you hear me, John? Uh, I have three questions. Um, uh, uh, first of all, thank you for your, the, the video you, you presented to us this morning. Um, I have three questions regarding the projects you, 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 you collaborate with. Um, first, uh, are the websites uh, available with low connections and with cell phones? Because you presented us on the video screen uh, only uh, computer um, uh, views from uh, from a, com a laptop uh, or computer screens. Uh, which are the languages? Uh, the all the 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 the, thing, the the websites and things you you create uh, are available. And finally, my third question is: um, Do you have any reports of who are those who use the um, watch uh, all the, the videos on the, the devices you provide? Um, where do they come from? Uh, are they from the communities you you you, you work with, or with uh, other parts uh, of the any region of the world? Thank you. No problem. For the websites, we try our best to make sure that they're available for all formats. Um, we use the St. Andrews template with the university. For the videos produced for the museum in Shetland, they had laptop quality videos, but also iPhone quality video. Um, their QR codes linked directly to the iPhone quality of video, so that even if you're on a, um, an Android, you would have better quality for your screen. Um, the site languages usually are in English. The university doesn't like to spend on funding on um, translation for the websites. Um, so the websites we produce are all done through the St Andrews University. Um, we try and give any uh, data we produce, we give full access to the communities we're working with for them to use whichever way they want. Um, so they can use them in their websites in their own native language. As for the analytics of the reports, well, for the EULAC museums, it was a worldwide um, reception that was received through all the um, different videos, different links to the museums. Um, for the shared island stories, it's mostly the local communities that are using it at the moment. We're hoping they're going to start advertising that and branching out. However, with these um, projects we've been working with, because we were dealing with such small communities, it does take time, but we noticed with the Community Crafts and Culture project, the first project I worked with, um, as we developed more and more input to the website, the hits from around the world grew larger and larger. Um, it's all about promotion. If you don't tell anyone about your website, you won't get any visitors. So social media and um, universities and networking again is key, sharing each other's um, posts so that your followers are mixing with other people's followers because there's no point in doing the research if no one actually sees it. I hope that's answered your questions for you. Thank you very much. Est-ce qu'il y a une autre question dans la salle ou sur le chat? Merci. Euh, je ne vais peut-être pas poser la question au monsieur, euh, euh, mais simplement à vous qui comprenez le, 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 les, son explication tout à l'heure quand il faisait des démonstrations avec les techniques pour attraper les, je sais pas, les rats, les souris, et en même temps de, de faire des applications avec des smartphones. C'est pour, pour emmener des méthodes ludiques dans le, la, au sein de la, des musées, je crois. En fait, c'est tout un projet de numérisation du patrimoine, euh, mais qui a été fait à la fois dans les Shetland euh, en Écosse, mais aussi euh, au Barbade. 
Oui. Uh, so the uh, a general question, John, is what are the objectives of uh, all this numerization and digitalization project, please? Well, the primary object is to bring in the young people. We find that if you have technology linked to their heritage, they're much more receptive to being partaking of it. It allows them to share it um, with their friends, the networks that they have. It also gives us a digital record to for archival work, for research purposes. We have, the more footage we have, then the more research we can reflect back to. Um, the purpose of the digitization is mostly for, we find that the communities that we are working with need aspects of digitization, be it um, advertising for different types of tourism, pre uh, preserving their intangible cultural heritage. And we find that using technology for that allows the community to make a, a better use of the research that we have, also gives our researchers much better information and much wider scope for what they want to do. The purpose for digitization, we, I think at the moment, is, is basically for preservation, for documentation and preservation. Um, it's a developing process at the moment for us as, a, as we're moving forward, but we find it's always best to base it in what the community wants, and then that therefore leads your digitization and how you use it moving forward from there. Thank you very much. It's great. Thank you very much, uh, John, for your talk. Um, so can you just explain to us maybe how the community uh, are able to share their uh, recordings? So is it a, um, a collaborative platform where the people can just share and deposit the recording, or is it only people you work with who can co collaborate directly? Well, for the project, we found that um, the people and themselves would um, record the, the information and upload it to OneDrive, which we would share that way. We have had conversations about making a cooperative of small museums where they hold a central database themselves and can input from all over. That was the uh, community heritage project was focused around that where small, tiny community museums come together um, to have conferences or to utilize technology websites. For us, we are more facilitators rather than managers. We want to be able to give them the knowledge and the technique and the skills they need so that it, it doesn't rely on us, they are able then to take it forward themselves. So education and training would be quite a large part of making any cooperative like that work. Ça répond à votre question? Okay. So, John, thanks again for being with us uh, this uh, the, tonight for you and uh, this morning for us. Mm -hmm. And uh, see you soon, uh, hopefully. <laughs> Thank um, you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you.